In this video, we're going to look at Higher Human Biology Unit 2 Physiology and Health, Carrier 3 Antenatal and Postnatal Screening, specifically Section B, which is the one concerned with pedigrees, autosomal dominant, autosomal recessive, um, incomplete dominance from an autosomal point of view, and sex linked recessive. Sex linked dominant is not specified as one of the types of inheritance you need to know, but as a problem solving, it could be asked in the exam. Just use the same logic you would for any other condition to answer those questions. So we're going to look at autosomal versus sex linked inheritance, explain how one can use a Punnett square in um, identifying conditions with incomplete dominance, look at autosomal recessive conditions and how we can use family trees, little tricks and pedigrees to identify the genotype of different individuals. We'll look at the same techniques you can use for autosomal dominant, look at sex linked recessive conditions, and probably in the, uh, the next video, we'll look at postnatal screening and the cause and management of female ketoneuria. So there's some terms that we might have from National 5. We have homozygous, we have heterozygous, and look at that, we have homozygous again. Um, although that should, that's mislabeled, isn't it? So um, when we talk about the genotype, we have to go right back to our basic understanding of biology. In uh, fertilization, the sperm and the egg fuse. When they do this, the nuclei join and the chromosomes from one gamete and the chromosomes from the other uh, form homologous pairs. So if we imagine this is chromosome 7, uh, and this is the chromosome 7 from the other parent, we have the gene. Now, the gene locus is the part of the chromosome which if you go to any human in the world that is where the gene that causes or controls that um, aspect of the phenotype is found so if you go to this bit here two centimeters down chromosome seven on anyone you will find the gene for temperature regulation if you go slightly lower you will find the gene for eye color the gene is just the part of the chromosome that controls that trait the allele is the word we use for what form of that gene you have, what your ACs, Ts and Gs will tell your body to make protein-wise. So you can see here, uh, I am colorblind, so I'm going to say that this is the same color of red. This person is homologous, uh, sorry, homozygous for uh, this allele. They have both copies are the same from each parent. So homozygous means you have the same allele for each parent. The word in itself does not tell us if it is a dominant allele or a recessive allele. So you could be homozygous dominant, which is this um, genotype here. So this shows the two chromosomes beside each other and the alleles that you have. We represent it by single letters just because it gets very cluttered in um, Punnett squares if you use big words. So we have this is the dominant allele. We can tell it's the dominant allele because it uses a capital letter. This is the recessive allele you can see as the second allele in the heterozygote here. Um, so this person here has two of the same dominant alleles, so we say they're homozygous dominant for that trait. This person is heterozygous, which means they have a dominant and a recessive allele. When we have this kind of situation here, one of these alleles in um, complete dominance will win. It will be the one that is expressed in the phenotype. That allele is the dominant allele. So this person will have the dominant phenotype and so will the heterozygote. When it says homozygote, that should have two small h's. Uh, so again, this person will have the recessive phenotype. The only way in autosomal inheritance that you can have the recessive phenotype is by having two copies of the recessive allele. Underneath here, we have a very complicated looking set of terms, which we will look into in a bit more detail when we uh, look at sex linked recessive. Uh, conditions. So you can see X, R, X, R, and then you can see some Ys over here as well. This is because um, females natally have two X chromosomes. And um, so the alleles that are on those chromosomes, we have to specify that the individual is a female um, by giving them two Xs. And then we just do what we do up here. We put the actual allele beside the letter of the chromosome. Because females have XX and males have XY, we have an interesting difference from National 5 genetics. So males do not have this second X chromosome and the Y will not carry the gene that is on that chromosome. So you can see here, males only get one 
uh, allele for whatever the, uh, the trait is. So we've looked at dominance, the allele that will be found in the phenotype if you are heterozygote. We looked at recessive, the allele which will only be seen in the phenotype if you're homozygous for it. And intermediates. So this is something that we'll look at in the incomplete dominance section. We've looked at alleles and we've touched a little bit on sex-linked inheritance. So we've looked at genes, we've looked at alleles, dominant recessive, genotype, phenotype, heterozygous and homozygous. So some other interesting terms we have is the parental generation. Now this is a relative term. The parental generation is the first generation that we are looking at. We're not going back 400,000 years to the first ever human that existed or further back to the first uh, life on the planet. This is just the first pair of humans that we are interested in. These will have parents. But this is the first generation for us, so this is the parental or P. The next generation after that, slightly confusing, is the first generation um, because we're talking about the offspring. The F doesn't actually stand for first. Uh, this is bad. Um, it stands for filial. So this is the first filial and second filial generation. When we're looking at a pedigree here, the squares tend to show males and the circles tend to show females. And the colour here will tell you what the phenotype of that individual is. So this square here is an affected male. So if we're talking about a medical condition, this person has the condition and this person does not have the condition. These two mate and produce an offspring and the offspring does not have the condition. So what that probably tells you is that if blue was the dominant allele, this person cannot be het, um, homozygous because if they were homozygous, they would have two of the same allele and it would be dominant and they would have to pass that on to the next generation. Interestingly, we know that white is the dominant here um, because two individuals with a particular phenotype that mate together and are able to produce an offspring that has a different phenotype, their phenotype must be the dominant one. Now that sounds a bit confusing, but these two, if we think about it, are displaying a phenotype. So if they were displaying the recessive phenotype, they would both be homozygous, say little r. So little r, little r, little r, little r. No matter how you join those uh, alleles together, you can't get a big R because it would not be, if, that, if white was the recessive phenotype, there is no way to join the recessive alleles together to get the dominant phenotype. White must be the dominant phenotype and both of these must be what we call the heterozygote. So most of them, both of them must have the big letter, which gives them their phenotype, and then be hiding a little small letter, recessive allele in their genotype. The two recessive alleles, one in four times, will look at Punnett squares, will join together to give you these blue individuals. So using that logic, we can decide that white is the dominant uh, allele for this condition. And that that means the condition is autosomal recessive because it's on the autosomes, which are chromosomes one to 22. And when we're looking at this, we don't need to worry about X's and Y's. And you can actually use that logic to work out the genotype of most of the individuals. So autosomal dominant, as we said, you can actually use that little trick I showed you there to work out all the heterozygotes. So we're looking for two organisms that mate together and produce one of a different um, phenotype. There are not in, which is unfortunate. Um, so this autosomal dominant condition, um, you can see that in this case, the um, affected parent here, if it passes on its allele, its offspring will have the condition. The interesting thing about autosomal dominant conditions is they can't come from absolutely nowhere. Um, you have to have an affected parent to pass the, um, the condition on. You can see that these two have luckily not given the condition to this offspring here, which means this line of the family here is not affected by the condition. We'll talk about autosomal recessive conditions in a second, and that is not the case. You can have, as we looked at the previous example, a heterozygous mating. Um, so in this case, the affected parent passes it on to uh, two of their children. That affected parent passes it on to that child, and this affected parent passes it on to both their children.
Because it is a dominant condition, you can have affected individuals who have the, um, the heterozygous genotype and they will still display, display this phenotype, or you can have individuals that are homozygous dominant, um, but we don't have any of those in this condition here. So we hopefully can understand the gene is um, the part of the chromosome that causes this condition. The allele, we have affected and unaffected for freckles. Uh, the dominant allele is the capital letter, the one that causes this um, horrible condition. Um, recessive is the normal, no freckles geno uh, phenotype. The genotype is the two copies of the allele we have, and heterozygous is this, homozygous is that. In this condition, autosomal recessive, it is not possible um, to always see um, where the condition has been inherited. So autosomal recessive is not quite as obvious as autosomal dominant. In autosomal recessive, we are looking for two individuals who mate together and produce a differently phenotyped offspring. That is how, if they didn't give you the genotypes of these individuals, you can work out which color, white or black, is dominant or recessive. So because two white um, shapes are able to make a black shape, that means the black must be uh, recessive. And the recessive phenotype is always homozygous. So that is uh, homozygous recessive here, and that's homozygous recessive. Because this individual here is um, dominant, we know they have at least one big H, and in the question, they seem to have given us, you can see because it's a different color to the other ones, they've given us this individual's genotype. Because this individual has the dominant phenotype and one of its parents has the recessive phenotype, it must have got the dominant allele from the other parent. There's no way that the black circle has given it this big H. So this parent must have passed on a big H, and this one only has small h's to pass on, so that must be what we have here. Again, because these two are able to mate together to produce an individual of a different phenotype, they must be heterozygous because they are displaying the dominant phenotype, but they have a recessive allele to pass on to their offspring. This individual here could be homozygous um, for the dominant, or they could be a heterozygous just based on the, uh, the genotypes of their parents. We use what's called a Punnett square um, to work out the likelihood of two individuals having offspring of particular genotypes and phenotypes. If we take the parental cross here, we have a heterozygote, which is a uh, big allele, small allele, so the dominant and the recessive, and we have the homozygous recessive. So one in four times, the, um, the white square here will pass on its big H and the other individual will pass on its small H. Now, interestingly, because the other individual only has small H's, we can actually ignore one of the rows because both rows are going to be identical because this one is always going to pass on the same. So 50% of the time, the, um, the white square will pass on its dominant allele, which means you will get a heterozygote with a dominant phenotype, and 50% of the time will pass on its recessive allele, and you will get homozygous recessive. So 50% of their offspring will have the recessive uh, phenotype, 50% will have the dominant phenotype, 50% will have a heterozygous genotype, and 50% will be homozygous recessive. Autosomal incomplete dominance is very interesting. The non-human biology example, which is the easiest to uh, use to get into the topic is, if you make a red rose, which is capital R, capital R, with a white rose, which is capital W, capital W, the red rose will pass on its capital R, the white rose will pass on its capital W, and your genotype will be capital R, capital W. Now, in this situation, we don't have, uh, we have two different alleles, but it's not a proper heterozygote in the way we've seen before. One of the alleles is not dominant to the other, it's incomplete dominant. So what that means is you would end up with a different phenotype. So from a red and a white parent, you would then get a pink rose. In human biology, we have examples like sickle cell anemia. Sickle cell anemia is a condition where um, the red blood cells are an odd shape and they are not able to carry oxygen very well and they get trapped in small vessels in your body. It's quite sore and um, it can lead to a shortened lifespan. So in this case, the sickle cell allele is capital S. 
most people watching this video will have normal haemoglobin, which is the A allele. So capital A is normal haemoglobin. Someone who has two capital A's will have a normal phenotype, their red blood cells like you and I, circular, able to carry oxygen, it's all fine. Someone who has two S alleles, sickle cell uh, disease, will have sickle cell um, red blood cells. And someone who has a capital A, a normal, a capital S, sickle cell, is what we call sickle cell trait. They're not a carrier, they're not, um, one isn't winning over the other, they have a different phenotype. They have slightly sickled um, red blood cells. Interestingly, the reason this has not been completely removed from the human population is that it confers some ability to not get malaria. So sickle cell trait and sickle cell disease are found more commonly in areas that have um, these plasmodium, these parasites that um, cause malaria. So it's a different phenotype to both of the parents. Finally, we have sex-linked inheritance. So the trick with sex-linked inheritance is not to panic and to remember that we have to write down our X's and Y's. So if the question, for example, said, what is the genotype of number four here, this white circle? First thing to do is say, is it male or is it female? So circles, it looks like a female. So the first thing we would write on the answer line is a big X and a big X right beside it. And then we would look at what the colouring of that circle is. So we know the, um, the gender, the sex, and um, the circle is an unaffected female. So if we already know that this was recessive, um, then you um, would know they would have at least the dominant allele. If you already know, sorry, yeah, uh, if you know that female is unaffected and um, they have this phenotype, they have at least one of the dominant alleles. If the female was affected, you would know that both of their X chromosomes have the recessive allele. So that's the same situation as having an autosomal recessive condition. Above the um, right-hand index here of the X, you would put a small R, and above the other one, you'd put a small R. Um, because males only have one copy, there we go, uh, because males only have one copy of the um, X, all of the males here are XY. This male here is not affected. If we know this is a recessive condition, that means his X at the top right hand corner will have um, the capital R. If we know this male here is affected, his X at the top right hand index will have a small R. This one, small R, this one, small R, this one, small R, this one, big R, this one, small R. It's a lot simpler because in sex-linked inheritance, the male's phenotype also tells you the genotype. So we look at all these ones here. Because that male is affected, his only X has the, uh, unaffected, his only X has this dominant R. Because this male is affected, small R, small R, small R, small R, small R, big R. We can then use that. So this female is affected. So she is X with a, if it comes up, maybe it does. Yeah, she is X with a small r, X with a small r. Um, and because this um, this male is affected, we've already done. This female here, she got one of her X's from her dad. So that is X big R. But her other X came from her mother, who only has X small r's. So her genotype must be X big R, X small r. We know that she is mated with a male who is X big R because that is his phenotype. And um, we know, therefore, that um, this female here is X big R and X big R. We can work our way around this genotype just using these rules. Um, there's an extra word that we get in sex-linked inheritance, and that is carrier. Females who we would normally call a heterozygote, in sex-linked inheritance we call a carrier. Because males only have the one X chromosome and can't have another one and be carriers, males are more likely to be affected by sex-linked um, recessive conditions than females are. Um, so it's just something you need to get used to, making sure you put the X chromosomes and the Y chromosomes in before you even look at the question um, and making sure you remember to then put the alleles in, remembering that a male's genotype and phenotype will be the same in these and the females 
are not called heterozygotes, they're called carriers in this situation. So it talks about karyotypes being the um, image of the individual homologous chromosomes lined up, and it helps us diagnose conditions. You should have one copy from each parent. So when we get to chromosome seven, we see three copies, a trisomy, that automatically tells us this person will have a genetic condition. And trisomy 21, for example, is Downs. There's trisomy 13, there's other trisomies as well. There's Edwards, there's um, Downs, there's lots of ones. While we're here, we might as well look at postnatal screening um, because there's not an awful lot in this little subsection. So it's common to test for certain metabolic disorders after birth. So this is what postnatally means. So phenylketonuria, PKU, is one of the conditions that we would test for. In phenylketonuria, we have a substitution mutation. So remember, this is one of our single uh, gene mutations. So in this case, it looks like the C has been changed to a T, and that changes one of the letters in the RNA to an A and changes one of the amino acids. We have a missense mutation. That means that um, the enzyme which normally converts something called phenylalanine in your diet into tyrosine does not work. Individuals with high levels of phenylalanine can suffer lots of um, issues. So they are placed on a restricted diet where they do not have um, a lot of phenylalanine in their diet. Um, that's it. That's basically all you need to know. You need to know postnatal is uh, after birth, that PKU is caused by a substitution mutation, and that you restrict the diet of these people. So autosomal conditions are conditions found on chromosomes 1 to 22, because males and females have the same number of chromosomes 1 and 22. That's kind of irrelevant if there's X and Ys. Uh, sex and inheritance are, for the purposes of the course, um, alleles for genes found on the X chromosome. So we put the Xs and Ys into the genotype. We should be able to use a Punnett square to show incomplete dominance. So that's where you have individuals with different letters mating, um, but neither allele is dominant over the other. So you get an intermediate or different phenotype. Explaining how to use a family tree to look at autosomal recessive. So remembering autosomal recessive conditions can um, skip generations because heterozygotes can pass the alleles on without being affected themselves. Autosomal dominant conditions can only be passed on by affected parents. So every individual who hasn't had what's called a de novo mutation, so it's not just come out of nowhere. If it's been inherited, it has to be inherited from an affected family member. Explain a use of family tree uh, to look at um, sex-linked recessive. So we're looking at sex-linked recessive, X's and Y's, males, phenotype to genotype being the same, carriers in females, and the fact that males are more likely to be affected because we only have one X. Postnatal screening being carried out after birth, the cause of PKU being a substitution mutation and managed by restricting the diet for phenylalanine. That was quite a long video, so thanks for staying with me. If you want to ask any questions, please do.